Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Uh, Y'all bow with me. Heavenly Father Yahweh, we come before you on your Sabbath day. We praise you and we thank you so much for this beautiful day, these beautiful people gathered in this beautiful place. We just thank you so much for all the blessings you give us every day that we take for granted. We, we know that you're here with us, Father, and we, we pray that this message is a, is a blessing to you and to those listening. And I also pray that you be with me as I deliver the word, that, it, that anything unnecessary or or untrue, just be ignored and let it fall to the ground and, and let your word resonate with your people, Father, and those listening online and those who will hear this in the future. We thank you so much for all things in Yeshua's name. Hallelujah. All right. So have the courage to encourage. You know the phrase... Have you ever been told, you ever have one of those days, you know, everybody's heard that from somebody at some time. You ever had one of those days? Usually that just implies that whoever had one of those days had a bad day. It's not too unusual. I mean, we've all had those days, right? But why is it that we as human beings sit around and perpetuate our sorrows and grievances one to another, compare our heartaches, compare our woes. I mean, I hear it all the time. I hear it here. I hear it out in the world. I mean, if you had a bad day, just wait till the next guy hears about it. You think that's bad. You think that's bad. Well, you won't believe what I went through today. Well, knowing, knowing Yahweh like we do, we know that he understands that we're frail that we're fickle, that we have those days, right? He allows those days. We seem to have so many reasons we should be upset and miserable. But when you take a step back, a really big step back, I don't mean like to this morning. I mean just take yourself out of the equation altogether and those people around you and look at the world for what it is. It is an, it's an, just an immaculate, beautiful piece of creation. So knowing this, knowing Yahweh, knowing he's in charge, knowing he allows these things to happen, knowing that he puts these things in our path, there's got to be a better way to handle having one of those days versus sitting around and complaining about it to your brother, your sister, your family, coworker. Because having one of those days and complaining about it perpetuates those things further. Complaining about whatever it is, you name it, to a brother in the faith, a sister in the faith, your physical brother, physical sister, coworkers, it doesn't do anything to improve your day or their day. If anything, it, it tempts them to explain how bad their life is. And that's not what life is for. Scripture guides us in a lot of different ways how to love one another, how to be kind, how to be gracious, be giving and charitable. But what does it say about how to handle someone who's discouraged, who's depressed or lost in sin? And usually those three things are why we have one of those days. is because there's something, we're, we're discouraged about something. Or something comes in our way that keeps us from attaining a goal that's right in front of us. Or a little farther off, you're trying to get started on a project and something just seems to buffet you and push you away. Or you're depressed. I know personally of a handful of people in my own life that suffer from depression or lost in sin. Maybe you know somebody that is in the body, in your immediate circle that we worship with that is lost in sin and you know about it. How do you handle that? You can't just sit around and complain about how bad your life is. That's not going to help them. That's not going to help you. Scripture tells us a lot. Scripture gives us a lot of information on, on what to do. And my first, my first uh, scripture I'm going to go to very quickly is Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in Yahweh always, and again I say rejoice. Now, this is an extremely simple verse. You know, you hear this when we sing the song, Rejoice in Yahweh always. But it's a lot easier said than done. Sometimes you're down, and it's hard to find something to be thankful for. However, simply smiling when you're sad can help turn your attitude around. Now, I know it seems silly, but sorrow feeds sorrow. As I said earlier, pain feeds pain. And if you're unwilling to break that cycle that gives, that 
and give thanks to Yahweh for what you do have. And just give him a smile. Give yourself a smile. If you're not willing to do just that very, that's a good first step. Is just to give yourself a smile. Smile to Yahweh and be thankful for what you do have. Even if it isn't, you may not have a lot, but you have more than most. If you're unwilling to break that cycle, and you're, you're just going to perpetuate your own sadness. And it's an unnecessary burden that you're putting on yourself. It's completely unnecessary. And we as human beings cling to misery just for dear life. For whatever reason, that's just, we, that is our nature, is to cling to misery. And to spread that misery around. Not only is it not enough for us to have misery on our, in our own lives, but we want everybody else to have that misery too. Moving on to uh, verse 8 of the same chapter, Philippians. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Now, why on earth would they, would they advise that? Because if, you are, if you've got your mind on things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy, there's not room for misery in your life. There's not room to be upset and angry about things that may be happening in your life. It takes discipline, and that is, that is a hard thing. This, is, this doesn't sound like much. I don't want this to sound like another um, fluffy message, like, oh, go and live a great life. This is hard. This is a very tall order for anybody, everybody in this room, to be able to cancel out the noise of the world, to cancel out the noise in your, in, in your own home, in your own family, in your coworkers, or wherever you may be, to be able to only focus on these things and think about them. If you do this, you free yourself of that burden that is completely unnecessary. I mean, we all know that one coworker, well, I'll just use a coworker as an example. You can use friends or family, but that one coworker who has never had a good day in his life, and he will let you know about it every morning. Well, because he's focused on the wrong things. He doesn't, and granted, Yahweh bless him, he doesn't know any better for the most part. But we do. We do. You should never be that person going into work and bringing everybody else down. That should never be the case. There's no excuse for it. Yahweh gives us a very simple recipe right here. Think on something good. If you've got a bad attitude, stop thinking about it. Think about something good. Think about something that is excellent, that is praiseworthy, that is pure. What you allow in your mind has an incredible effect on you. Whether it's music, movies, day-to-day -day conversations. I mean, it really doesn't matter. It's a very broad spectrum. And Satan's influence and Yahweh's influence are both extremely widespread. But you have to work for Yahweh's influence. You have to try. Satan's is easy. We're all under constant bombardment from the enemy. We have to control what we allow in. Otherwise, we give Satan a foothold. Sometimes you have to go through a bad time. Some time that is hard to be thankful that you're going through. You have to go through a time that you wish you weren't going through. We know Messiah went through that very thing. If it is possible, let this pass from me. I mean, even if you want to talk about having a bad day, that doesn't get any worse than that. But even he went through that and didn't break his stride. He didn't let it break him down. And you, sometimes you have to go through that before you're able to take that step back that I talked about earlier and be thankful for the things you do have. So if you catch yourself in um, a state of complaining about maybe you're having a bad day about whatever it may be, that's okay. Just make sure you understand that, recognize it, take that step back and re refocus on the good things as mentioned in Philippians 4.8. Now... 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 5 through 13 gives a wonderful example of, uh, of what we've been talking about here. The assembly in Corinth was struggling and fractured. Paul addresses all these issues earlier on, but I'm going to focus on the solution 
to these issues. We could read all day about issues. Scripture is full of issues, but it's also full of solutions. And that's what I want this message to be about today, not about how to have a problem. We, can, we all know how to do that. That's effortless. However, a solution is not always as simple. Oh, and I've got it on the slide, but I encourage everybody to follow along in their Bibles too. 2 Corinthians 7, verses 5 through 13. For when we came to Macedonia, we had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn. Conflicts on the outside, fears within, but Elohim, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. Not only, not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you had given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever. Even if I caused sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy, because you were made sorry, because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as Elohim intended, so you were not harmed in any way by us. Righteous sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what is righteous and sorrow, see what this righteous sorrow has produced in you. What this earnestness and what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point, you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. So even though I wrote to you, it was neither on account of the one who did the wrong, nor on account of the injured party, but rather that before Elohim, you could see for yourselves how devoted to us you are. By all of this, we are encouraged. Now, there's a lot, there's a lot to take in there, but the general gist of this, someday you may find yourself interacting with someone, as Paul was at this situation, who may be going through something, who may be, let's say, they're depressed or of a shortcoming they've experienced, or maybe they were in sin. You very well could have a situation, situation arise that requires you to be a little stern with this person, or vice versa. Somebody may interact with you, and they may have to be a little stern with you to correct yourself or you correcting somebody else, and they may take it the wrong way. Now, you don't have to raise your hand, but I know there are people in here, when somebody has corrected you and something you're doing wrong, how many of you just embrace them and thank them for it? Again, not an easy thing to do. It is against human nature. It's the pride, the pride of man that kicks in, and it just, there's nothing worse than being corrected on something that you think you know. To be able to accept that and move on in love is a challenge. And on the other hand, if you are correcting somebody else and something they know is right, in some situations you could see their entire world crashing down on them, how you deliver that message may be the single most important thing you do in their life. That very moment in correction. Back in verse 3, there's something important. He says, we didn't read this to begin with, but probably should have, I do not say this to condemn you. I have said before that you have such a place in our hearts that we would live or die with you. That's, a pretty, that's, a, that's quite a, something to say to somebody. I'm not saying this to condemn you. I'm saying this in love and know that I would die for you. I would live for you and I would die for you. That's a powerful, that is a powerful statement. We have to make it clear that we're not correcting as to condemn somebody, but to build them up, to see them grow and draw closer to Yahweh and Messiah. How you say something is just as important as what you say. You can say the absolute right thing, 100% correct in a technical aspect. But if you say it the wrong way, you might as well have not said anything. Or worse, said the wrong thing. Proverbs uh, 15.1, I don't think I have, no, don't have this one up, ignore that for now. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Again, you can be absolutely 100% correct, but if you're addressing an issue that arises and you don't handle it with grace and mercy and love and compassion and all the fruits of the spirit that Pastor Randy's been talking about, if you don't address these issues 
with those in mind, you risk screwing it up very badly. I, working for the ministry, I'm in a unique position that I'm dealing with strangers on a daily basis. And when I first started, Randy would have to come out and be like, all right, you got you to move on to something else. You can't sit there and just angry type all day because I was so, I got to get these people correct. I got to get them, show them what's right. I got to do it now. And I've learned since then to just pump the brakes it's better to have one slow, thought out, merciful message go out in a day versus 50 angry ones about why somebody's wrong about something. Over in 1 Thessalonians, we're going to be spending a lot of time in Thessalonians, just so you know. 1 Thessalonians 2, 11 through 12, for you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging and comforting urging you to live lives worthy of Elohim, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Yahweh deals with us as though we were his children. And as most of you know, children have a knack for being discouraged. As their parents, you have to pick them up and dust them off and encourage them. I mean, I remember when I was trying to ride a bike, and I just couldn't get it. I remember falling off and falling off and falling off, being terrified of riding that bike. But, you know, they'd pick you up, dust you off. Mom would kiss the boo-boo, and Dad would put a Band-Aid on you and just keep you going. And eventually you get it. But the thing is, you have, you have to keep going with, with the child when it comes to something. I struggled with math as when I was younger, and I hated it. Still not a fan, but I can do it. But that's only because my parents were consistent with me. They never gave up on me. They never stopped. Yahweh deals with us in that way. I don't know what your bike is that you're falling off of every single day. I don't know what your math problem is, proverbial math problem that you're struggling with every day, but Yahweh never gives up on you. He doesn't want you to stop trying to ride that bike, to solve that math problem, to do better, to move on. You have to look, again, when you take a step back and you look at it through Yahweh's eyes, imagine your child. If you're blessed to have children, imagine your child struggling with something. You wouldn't just step back and just let them fail. You would want to do what's best for them. There are dozens of examples of this encouragement throughout Scripture. But how about mankind encouraging mankind? You know, we can see, you can go, if you want to be encouraged in yourself between you and Yahweh, go read the Psalms, the Proverbs. I mean, it's beautiful. But when it comes to people interacting with people, Paul and his epistles are just about second to none. It's all, that's all he did was write these assemblies and encourage them. Paul and Timothy address uh, the Philippians with a warm, heartfelt letter. And we're going to read verses 1 through 11 of chapter 1. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Yeshua Messiah, to all saints in Messiah, Yeshua, who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace be from Yahweh our Father and the Master Yeshua Messiah. I thank Elohim upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, speaking requests for you with all joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Yeshua Messiah. Just as it is right for me to think this of all of you, of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers with me in grace. For Elohim is my witness. How greatly I long for you all with the affection of Yeshua Messiah. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Messiah, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Yahshua Messiah, the glory and praise of Elohim. I mean, that's quite a greeting. And I mean, it was, it was substantial enough that we have it in Scripture. And we see Paul and Timothy pouring encouragement over this assembly and its members. Now, obviously, we know how hard it is to start an assembly and to grow one. But 
you also have to understand how hard it is to be gentle and kind to those seeking truth. We have to remember to show love to those people that are seeking and striving truth. We have to remind them how precious they are every day. That they're, that they're not only precious to the Father, but to us as well. Because when the body grows in strength, we all have less weight to carry. And that's something that, that, that's sadly lacking, I would say, is a sense of true love in the assemblies. And I mean like what we see here. If we received a letter saying something like this, I feel like most of us would be like, ooh, that's a little weird, right? I mean, I would, and that's not, and that's not a good thing. I mean, this is, this is Paul and Timothy we're talking about. These are the people we read in Scripture every day. This is how they talk to each other. It's not easy to love people in this way. In the age of technology and anonymity, it's easy to, you know, we're all kind of veiled in a cloak. We don't ever really have to confront or talk to people face to face anymore. And this could be a blessing. It can be a curse. But it's easy to feel disconnected from people. I mean, when's the last time we even got a handwritten letter from somebody? Right? I mean, we get one, you know, we have prisoners that write in. That's only because they don't have any other option. We've all been there. We're online, see a person we disagree with, and it's just, you just lay into them. Like Pastor Randy said, you just get the biggest two by four and just go to town. And, it, and it's scary how easy this is to fall into this madness online. It really is. It's scary to see how quickly you become upset, you become angry, you become cold, and just without concern for what they're thinking, what they're going through. You just want to know that you want them to understand that they are wrong. It's easy to break out the sarcasm, the name calling. Thankfully, praise Yahweh, I have to remember I am speaking for Yahweh's assembly. But that should not be the reason I don't go into these things. The reason I don't go into calling names or sarcastic remarks or just general unpleasantness when I'm talking with people should be because I may be a emissary for the assembly, but I myself am an emissary of the kingdom, regardless of what assembly I belong to. It is so easy to fall into that. It's the opposite of how we should react. We have to reach out in love. We have to correct in love. We have to do everything in love. It's, it can be more applicable to online conversations, but honestly, real-life ones, a lot of people don't know how to have real-life conversations anymore. That's the reason why witnessing is such a challenge. I imagine for the generations prior, it was easier because that's all they knew was face-to-face -face conversation. But now, if you stick somebody out on the street... There's, not gonna, you, you, there's a reason you don't see street corner preachers anymore because it's just nobody does it anymore. But it's, it, I would encourage you, every one of you, those online, everybody, even if it's something, even if you people online disagree with us, I would still, you have to treat every conversation as if you're going to spend the rest of eternity with that person because that's the goal. I mean, why bother being angry and nasty? Our entire purpose is to bring as many people with us into the kingdom as we can. Imagine meeting somebody that you had an interaction with that might not have been so pleasant online. And guess what? Now you're with them for the rest of eternity. Yahweh willing, if you, by his grace, you're able to make it in after that faux pas. Dealing with strangers is hard. Dealing with family sometimes is harder. Spiritual family as well. I mean, it's easy to push people off that you may never see in your entire life. Because, you know, whatever. I'm never going to see that person again anyway. But imagine you see that person a couple times a week, every Sabbath. The body of Messiah is a finely tuned machine and it does not take much for it to get out of working order there are countless verses and passages about being encouraged in Yahweh but 
1 Thessalonians is just about perfect for what I'm talking about today. Sorry, I got another long reading for you, but it's, it's all applicable, I promise. It's not just padding. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 28. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write you. For you know very well that the day of Yahweh will come like a thief in the night, while people are saying peace and safety. Destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and hope of salvation as a helmet. For Elohim did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through Master Yeshua, Messiah. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in Yahweh and admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is Elohim's will for you in Messiah Yahshua. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good and reject every kind of evil. May Elohim himself, the Elohim of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our master, Yahshua Messiah. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet all Elohim's people with a holy kiss. I charge before you, Yahweh, to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. The grace of Master Yeshua be with you. So what can we do? What do we do specifically in the body of Messiah? Because there are so many ways you could apply things to your own self in the world. But I want to focus on the people here today, the people online, the people that are seeking truth because those are the flock. Yahweh will call the people who he will call and we'll deal with them as they come into our lives. And that's perfectly fine. But we have to deal with what we have right in front of us today. If you go through that scripture I just read, you'll notice I've got some bullet points here to kind of go through each one of these things. Acknowledge those who are doing the hard work and admonish us and care for us in the name of Yahweh. So one of the things that that is the most, there's a reason this is first on Paul's list. Because the easiest way to encourage the body is to support the body. If you've got people that are out doing the work that you may not want to do, that you may not, Yahweh gives us all gifts, right? So if there's somebody out evangelizing, Yahweh bless them. That is an incredible gift. The the Bishop family, they're an incredible example for witnessing. It is an absolute mind blower watching them work, hearing the testimonies that they have. Not everybody's blessed with that, but guess what? People like that, we should be absolutely behind giving them, you know, acknowledge what they're doing because that is hard work. It is not easy to get out there and witness Yahweh's word to people. Strangers, oftentimes they're um, defensive or arrogant or prideful. To be able to go out and do those things, it's a blessing. It says to hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. Now there's a reason he kept these two things together. 
The key here is live in peace with each other. It's easy to be envious of somebody that might have a gift that you don't have. But you have to live in peace with each other. We're all parts of the same body. You may wish you were born an eye of the body of Messiah. But guess what? Your lot in life that Yahweh gave you is a finger. So take what Yahweh's given you and work with it. But you have to live in peace. You can't let pride, you can't let envy, you can't let any of these things come in the way because it causes the body to malfunction and won't operate as smoothly as it should. you got to help each other. If you wish you had a, let's say there's a brother or a sister who's doing something that you pray that Yahweh allows you to do someday, encourage them. Why not? This one, next one's important. Warn those who are idle and disruptive. Warn those who are idle and disruptive. Not bludgeon them. Not get out. If you've got somebody who's, I will say, I'll say this, a baptized member. Somebody who has committed themselves to Yahweh. And you find them falling short. Or maybe they've got something that they don't agree with. There's ways to deal with it. Warn them. Now, when the time comes, if somebody is obviously causing a huge problem, at that point you take the necessary steps to keep it from happening. But you have to give them an opportunity to see the error in their ways and correct course. We're all in need of mercy and patience from Yahweh. So we should not hesitate to show that very same mercy and patience to those around us, especially those who may be struggling. If there's a doctrine they disagree with, that's fine. There's ways to deal with it. And I've been around when I've seen, well, it's just interesting things transpire. Sad things transpire when things are handled in a way that with no mercy, with no patience, nothing like that. It's just the wound is very raw when that person leaves. And that the reason that is so dangerous is because you might have cost the soul at that point. Next, encourage the disheartened. It's not enough to simply just see somebody come to Sabbath and you give them a handshake. Hey, good to see you. I mean, that's okay, but there's so much more. You don't know what these people are dealing with. We have a relatively small flock compared to a lot of places in the world. It shouldn't be as difficult as it is for us to know what each other are going through. It's not enough to just shake their hands, give them a hug once a week, or say, hey, I'm praying for you. I mean, those are all fine things. Those are perfectly fine. But a lot of times that's where people draw the line. Disheartened is as described. It is a verb. It means to depress, to ruin one's hope. If there are any among us who are disheartened, and I know there are, we have to do our best. If their hope is ruined, that's all we have as a hope in Messiah. That's it. If it wasn't for that, we'd have no hope. So if their hope is gone, if they're disheartened, we, we have to leave the 99 to bring them back into the fold. We have to do our very best to accommodate them and help shoulder that burden that they're going through. And that can be tough. Walls can go up, not necessarily because we're not trying, but because a lot of times people have so much pride they don't want the help. And that can be, you know, that, that's, you just have to deal with that on a situation-to-situation basis. But pride is a destroyer. I've seen it in my own life. I've been doing this for going on 21 years now. And as, even as a kid, I can remember seeing families, marriages, Everything just fall apart because one person would not accept the help. And before you know it, there's somebody who's absolutely broken inside and they lose their hope. And next thing you know, they're gone. And they may move on and you may never see them again. And I know it's easy to, when people walk out the door, it's easy to put them out of your mind because you don't look at them. 
every day. But Yahweh sees it all the time. It's fresh in his mind every single day. Sometimes simply sitting down with somebody and talking to them is effective. Don't just, don't just give them a handshake. If there's somebody you feel, and you know, some people's spirits are in tune to it more than others. And Yahweh bless them. But if you feel somebody struggling, go talk to them. They're right here, especially if they're here. Take time. If you don't sit down and talk with them, what do you have to lose other than them? Sometimes that's all it takes. I've sat down with people before just that I won't normally talk to. And man, they'll just spill your heart. They'll spill their heart out to you. Absolutely cats out of the bag. There are no secrets. They were just waiting for somebody to sit down and talk to them. It's Sometimes, you know, for you, it, it may be uncomfortable, but it's not about you at that point. It's about that person who has, it is struggling with these things. So encourage the disheartened. It's extremely important because to be disheartened, again, that's to lose your hope. It's to lose your hope. And if we don't have hope, we don't have anything. Help the weak. To be weak and to be disheartened are two different things. And you, obviously this could, this could be referring to the physically weak, the physically maimed, the disabled, those that can't help themselves. Help those that cannot help themselves. That seems like a pretty, that's like a no-brainer to me. But there are also spiritual struggles that we have to be there for our brothers and sisters to help pick them up again. They may still have the hope of Messiah, but they may be struggling with something. They may be spiritually weak. They may be predispositioned to succumb to certain things. And again, if you don't sit down and talk to them and get to know them, you'll never know that. I think it's important that we all get to know, that we really know each other, that we really know those people that come in, in the assemblies. Because how many of you don't know where your foot is or your finger or your ear? We're the body of Messiah. We have to know who is what and where they're at. So help the weak. That one, I think it's... It's a good practice to help those that you may see struggling physically. That's a good stepping stone because it opens the door for other things. Next, have patience with everyone. I honestly feel like everything here hinges on this one. You have to have patience with these people, with everybody. Just because something becomes easy or natural to you does not mean it comes so easy and natural to those around you. It's not an issue that's going to be solved immediately. There's going to be cases where we as an assembly have to continually help somebody in need. We have to be patient with them. Otherwise, we risk letting them slip in the darkness and then boom, they're disheartened. They lose their hope. And that's the, that, this, is, this is what is so humbling about all this, is that this is our responsibility. This isn't any one person's responsibility, this is everybody's responsibility to be patient with these people that come in that may not know everything, that may take time to understand what it is that they believe or what we believe, to understand the truth. The truth isn't something that happens overnight. And I think, again, patience ties in with Pastor Randy's message. You know, it's one of the fruits of the Spirit. There's a reason why all of these things can be backed up with the fruits of the Spirit. Next, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. This is another tough one. How often does your brother and sister do something to frustrate you? And this applies to children, too. How often do you see somebody or a family or somebody doing something and you're just like, ugh, I just wish they wouldn't do that. Grumble, grumble, grumble. That's what everybody does. How often do you respond with a sharp word or anger? 
not paying back wrong for wrong requires discipline. A lot of it. And again, if we're all a body and we're all functioning together, this is something nobody should ever have to handle on their own in any circumstance. There should be no circumstance where something happens in the body of Messiah that only two people are dealing with. We should be able to build each other up in that way. Now, that's not to say we have to air dirty laundry everywhere. But if there's something you're truly struggling with, something that stands between you and salvation, that should never have to be dealt with by yourself. You can diffuse an argument or a fight before it has a chance to explode. You can potentially save a family, a marriage, and again, even a soul. This could, that, that could be the linchpin that, keep, that is keeping somebody in the faith, true to Yahweh, is saving that relationship or whatever it is they're going through. I'm just using relationship as an example. Now, this next one. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is Elohim's will for you in Messiah Yeshua. When people say, I don't, you know what, if it's Yahweh's will, whew, if it's Yahweh's will, this will happen. We know what Yahweh's will. It says so right there. Rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. That's Yahweh's will for you. He doesn't, he's not as ambiguous and a lot of people like to think of Yahweh and his, and his path and his way as this far off thing that we don't understand. If you do these things, Yahweh's will will be revealed to you. What you need to do in your life will be revealed to you. But it requires you to do something. Yahweh, he offered salvation as a free gift. But there's no such thing as a free lunch. Everybody knows that. This gift is given freely of salvation. But as we, as we know here, just because you're given something doesn't mean you can't lose it. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. This is Elohim's will for you in Messiah Yahshua. Being content requires a mind shift. You can't live in the world and strive after things of the world and expect yourself to be content. It'll ne you'll never be satisfied. You have to decide that you're happy with what you have. Now, that's not to say that it's wrong to go out and find, and I want a new job. I want something better for myself. That's perfectly fine. But if you don't get it, be satisfied with what you have. Don't blame Yahweh. That is the easiest thing to do in this world is blame Yahweh for something you didn't get. Decide you're happy. After all, we all woke up on the right side of the dirt. Right? There's a lot of people that didn't. My family lived in a shed at Rocheport. And most people here know what the grounds look like at Rocheport. It was a pump shed for a water slide. Years and years ago. It was a long decommissioned when we were there. We lived in the shed for six months. It was a little bit bigger than one of the rooms in the gym. And there were six of us living in there. It had one window, no bathroom. As an adult, I see that situation and I have to say, I am blessed that I had parents that were a good example. <laughs> because as a child living in what most would consider squalor, I had nothing but fond memories. I had an absolute blast living in that just shed. It was an amazing time as a kid. One has to look at life as a child. Little children have an incredible gift, and Yahweh recognizes that. There's a video. I was going to play it, but it is a... It is a Christmas video. But there's a video out there. It's this little girl, and she gets a banana as a present. She gets a banana, and she opens it up, and she is absolutely blown away that she got a banana. 
She is so ecstatic. She got a banana. She was so happy. Thank you so much for this banana. I'm so hungry. And she ate it, and she was just content. If you, ever, if you never take time to look at the blessings you have in your life and are continually looking with envy at the lives and situations of others, you'll never be content. And you'll never be able to focus yourself on Messiah and Yahweh fully. It'll never happen. There's, Alan gave a message a long time ago now called the idolatry of self. And a lot of people think I, an idol is something that is, a, that is cast in gold that you bow down and you worship. It is so much more than that, and it's so much more dangerous than that. If it was that simple, life would be a whole lot easier. But if you put those things in life, those things, anything you put before Yahweh, and that, and that when I say anything, I literally mean anything before Yahweh and Yeshua, you'll never be content. The key to content to being content is to understand that Yahweh is all you need. That if you don't have anything, if you wake up tomorrow when everything was gone, but you still have that hope in Messiah, that is what, if you, until you're to that point to where they're enough, it'll never be enough. Lastly, do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good and reject every kind of evil. I am not going to touch on the prophecies. That is a message in and of itself. But I think it's important that if somebody comes in and claims to something, that Yahweh delivered a message to them or that they believe something's going to happen. Okay, well, let's see. Let's find out if that's the truth. However, the quenching of the spirit is something that I think is prevalent in today's assembly. And I think there's a good reason for it. I do. Not, not, not that it's right that it's happening, but I understand why it is happening. When we see the spirit being quenched, people think when the spirit's in the room, people think of somebody flopping around on the ground, speaking in tongues. That's what people think of when you think the spirit. And that is a gross perversion of what Yahweh's spirit is. But a lot of people come out of that background. So when they see quench the spirit, they think, well, they just don't have people flopping around on the ground. But there's so much more to it than that. A lot of times, in the name of being decent or normal, we don't, we don't want to look out of place. And this, I would say, applies more to our worship than I would anything else. A lot of times we'll stand there, you'll see people, and, and, it, and, it's, and it's a hard thing to unlearn. It is a hard thing to lose that pride of your self-image and what you look like. I mean, look at David. Now, I am not advocating that we all run around in our underwear. However, David lost himself in his worship of Yahweh. A lot of times I'll find myself kind of like, ugh, I see somebody moving around, dancing. I mean, I'm guilty of this, just like everybody else. I am guilty of this. I see people expressing themselves, daring to express themselves before the king of the universe, and I'm like, well, glad I'm not them. That's embarrassing. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a sad mindset that we do have. And it requires a little bit of introspection. Obviously, we don't want to be a distraction while we worship. We don't want... It is possible to take it too far to where people aren't focusing on Yahweh. They're focusing on whatever it is you're doing. But there is proper ways that you can express yourself. And it's a wonderful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Something as simple as lifting your hands when you're singing. Something so simple can make a connection with the worship. Really get into it. 
Raise your hands to Yahweh. After all, he's the king of the universe. You might as well. It's not like he's not looking at you right now anyway. You might as well show him. It's a great feeling when a song, a, a praise song to Yahweh resonates with you in your heart. And it feels like you're standing directly in front of him. I mean, it's all of our goal to see Yahweh face to face. So praise him like you're worshiping him face to face. Rejecting evil is something that we all have to do. When it comes to the assembly proper, elders and deacons shoulder a lot of this burden. However, that doesn't negate the responsibility of the body of Messiah either. If someone comes in causing trouble, not to be confused with an idle or disruptive member, but as somebody who is actively working against the body of Messiah shows up, we have to all reject them and send them away. Period. There should be no ifs, ands, or buts. Everybody needs to be in unison and telling this person to get out. I don't envy the role of the, of the eldership and the deacons. I don't envy them. To have to confront and deal with people, potentially dangerous people, that, that we need to have their back. We need to be behind them 100%. I hope that this message has encouraged you. Try to encourage your children, your friends, your spouse, your brothers and sisters in the faith, and even those you don't really know, you will not believe the effect you can have on people just in your day-to-day -day life. If you see a stranger who has a nice shirt on, say, wow, I really like your shirt, that can turn their entire day around. Sometimes more. Sometimes more. A simple compliment, a simple encouraging, just something so simple can change somebody's life. Just be nice. Be good. Be kind. Be patient with people. I mean, we're the light on the hill, right? I mean, that's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be the people that everybody strives to emulate. We have so much to be joyous for and thankful for and rejoice. We have a creator that loves us and understands us. We have a Messiah that willingly gave himself to us, an opportunity to spend eternity with him and his Father. We have blessings innumerable. We have, innumerable. We have families, children, a wonderful place to worship. Food in our bellies, you, that, 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 that alone. There's a reason why the food, it's an amazing blessing that we take for granted so often. We have a roof over our heads. And we here have an assembly we can call home. That is a, that's a huge one. There are literally hundreds of people online that would love to have what we have right here. I hear it every single day. Do you guys have, do you have an assembly in Norway? Do you have one in, in Nairobi? Do you have one here? Do you have one We're all over the world? People want what you have. You should be thankful and praise Yahweh and bless him every single day that you have what you have. We have so much more than most. Let us be an encouragement to those who do not have these things. Because it is easy to be discouraged when you, when you feel like you're out in the shadows. When you're out of the spotlight, I guess you'd say. We don't want people to feel like they're not appreciated, like they're not important. We have to show the light of Messiah in our day-to-day -day lives and how we communicate with one another. We need people that have never been here before to come here and be blown away. It's been said that we're the only Bible that people may ever read. Well, let's make it a good read. Let's not, not be a forgettable book. Let's be something that they remember. Do something encouraging for somebody that allows them to think back on you 15 years from now and they'll remember you for it. 
Yahweh bless you. Hey, Lucas here at the Wire and Production Studios. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking the logo over on the right. Also, ring that bell icon so that you're notified every time we upload a new teaching. And lastly, don't forget to download the YRM mobile app. It's free and full of content. If you love the Bible like we do, you won't want to miss it. And as always, thank you so much for watching.